Welcome to Mama Talk Talks, A Different Take, a podcast where everyday people around the globe share a different take on everyday issues. I'm your host, Ebi Mambo, and I'm pleased you're joining us today. Welcome. What a day. What a, what a day. Welcome, Susie. <laughs> it's totally okay. These things happen oh, with God. Zoom. They do. They do. Well, welcome to Mama Talk Talks, A Different Take, and... Um, I'm not even going to bore the audience with how we got here, but we're here now. And I'm really, really excited to have you. And um, good morning. I know you're in Minnesota. So good, did I say Minnesota? Uh, yes, I'm in Massachusetts. But it Massachusetts. is morning. It is morning. Well, please go ahead and introduce yourself to Mama Talk Talk. Okay, so uh, my name is Susie Chang. My sort of formal name is T. Susan Chang. That's where my publications go out. And I am, hmm, I do a number of things related to tarot. I teach tarot. I do readings for people. I sew tarot cases. It's an Etsy business. Um, And I have a tarot podcast called Fortune's Wheelhouse, which I co-host with a deck creator named Mel Moline. And that is sort of the main sort of brief for me. I also do some other things. I teach writing at a college nearby here, and I do some cookbook reviewing. That's a leftover from my previous career. But for the last five years or so, I've been sort of increasingly doing more and more tarot for people. I didn't know about the writing part, and I thought I had completed my research. (laughs) Um, so really excited to hear about that. But Susie, one of the things that I was hoping you talk about today, which I know is a fascination for a lot of people, is what is tarot? Yes, so tarot is a divination system. And what is divination? Well, sometimes known as sortilege is another way to describe divination. It's a way of using a system of objects to receive information that you would not otherwise receive. Um, It's called divination because it's a connection between yourself and something that's larger than you. Now, it may be the divine. People have different arguments about that. uh, But it is certainly a, um, a power or a force or something unseen that is beyond your what you conceive of as your own individual limited self go ahead okay so um i was just trying to think about how far to go with this Uh, i mean tarot uh many people use it for different things Mm -hmm. i think some people use it i would say the majority of people here on my side of the atlantic my side of the Pacific, I guess, from where you are, (laughs) Uh, use it as a self-actualization tool um, to help understand themselves better, to change their frame of reference when needed uh, to help achieve positive goals in their lives. Uh, But many people also use it for prediction. Um, That is sort of the, I would say, mm, from the 17th century on, mm, it's been it's had a history of being used as a predictive tool, like many other divination systems. And it depends, uh, some people use it in a very strict way and some people do not. I prefer to think of tarot as a map. So by that, I mean the same way you would use a map uh, to allow you to get from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. You, it helps you find different routes. It helps you locate where you are. It helps you, um, devise other ways of getting there. It gives you some information about how hard it's going to be to get there or how easy, but you don't have to do it. The map doesn't tell you what to do. You get to choose. You can choose a different route. You can choose a different map. You can go a different place. You can throw the map out the window. Uh, it is, you still have your free will. <laughs> now, that's one of the things that has been fascinating in conversations I've had about tarot mm-hmm. is the whole juxtaposition between free will and destiny. Yes. So you, you've just said that with, with tarot, you do have free will. Mm-hmm. And so when someone comes to you for the first time for a reading, what are they usually looking for? And what do you kind of tell them to guide them on the question of 
destiny or fate on the one hand versus free will on the other? Yes, it's a very, it's a question that underlies every reading, even though many people don't ask it. Uh, Most clients come with a preconception about fate and free will in their heads already. And it's interesting, some people come and they basically assume that there is something that's going to happen and they need to know what it is so that they can do something about it, uh, Mm -hmm. which is a contradiction in itself. But other people come and they say, well, you know, I don't really believe that there's any fate at all, that I really just do whatever, you know, I have complete control of my agency and my destiny, my own destiny and my own free will. And to me, you know, most people don't really worry about it. We just sort of deal with where they are (laughs) and work with it from there because I'm kind of at the intersection of the spectrum and I can work with people wherever they are. But my belief is that um, you have some control over your sort of short-term fate, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. What the astrologers would say, and I do work with a lot of astrologers, is that the things that are going to happen to you, uh, that that there is a larger fate that in one sense you cannot escape. So for example, if you're having your Saturn return, you're going to have certain things happen, but you have some choice over how that will manifest in your life, depending on your own behavior. So for example, you know, we are all a larger example right now of what's going on in the world is we are all being affected by coronavirus. However, how it manifests in our particular lives, we have some agency over because we can make certain choices about how we live our lives, how we adapt to it, you know. So Mm, to say that it's entirely fate or entirely free will is no more true in divination than it is in our real lives. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It does. And what's interesting in that is talking about Saturn return and me just kind of nodding as if I know what that means. I have no idea what that means. (laughs) 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 Let me me just, let me just own up to that. So, so, (laughs) Without totally digressing from tarot into astrology, which is another area I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. So if I take a giant step back, Mm -hmm. in, in, in Christianity, there's talk about, you know, Adam and Eve and and that history there and the new Testament, you know, choice. And even in the story of Adam and Eve, there's a story about, they were given the choice to eat or not eat of the, of the apple, right? Mm-hmm. However, yeah. that's interpreted. Yes. But in a very literal sense, that's what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. So in, in a way, there is, there is, in fact, free will, at least yes. in that part of religion. Yes. So then when I, when, when I, when I come to you in this, in this conversation about Haru, then I'm just wondering, how do we separate free will and that kind of roadmap or the natal chart that mm-hmm. you know, you, astrology gives you from what it is that you can will yourself to do. Because I think that's where the, so, so whatever Saturn return means, it sounds bad. I don't know. If it is. <laughs> so Saturn like return, I'll give you like the one sentence. <laughs> so so uh, when you look at a natal chart, the, pos- the planets are in a certain position in the sky, right? So it takes 29 years, approximately 28, 29 years for Saturn re- to return to its position in the sky. And when that okay. happens, people tend to uh, experience things that are, uh, traditionally ascribed to the planet Saturn. So something will force you to take responsibility for your life in some way. Saturn is a planet of responsibility. So many people find that uh, they face a crisis in terms of whether they commit to someone whether or to their job or to buying a house or, you know, that kind of thing around the time when they turn 28, 29 years old. And okay. many people have difficulty with that. <laughs> I'm thinking 28, 29, what decisions was I making in my life? Hmm. <laughs> I think I was having a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. I was. <laughs> so so I've, I've, I've studied a bit of tarot because I just think it's mm-hmm. interesting. And mm-hmm. talk to me a bit about the mechanics of it. I know that there's a major arcana, the minor arcana, and there's a story of the fool and all of yes. that. 
So talk to me a little bit about what, what that whole, and, and I know there are different kind of traditions mm-hmm. and just give us a flavor of what, of what that whole tarot journey is. Sure. So the major arcana, there are 78 cards in a tarot deck and 22 of them, as you mentioned, are the major arcana and the remaining 56 are the minor arcana, which are divided into four suits, the wands, the cups, the swords and the pentacles or discs. And um, I guess the sort of simplest way to describe it is that the major arcana describe these sort of larger forces in our lives um, internal parts of our personalities, larger components of uh, our unconscious and conscious world. They are archetypes. And whereas the minor arcana, the small cards, sometimes we call them, or pip cards, tend to describe more uh, everyday actions that you can take, situations you might find yourself in. They're a little bit more relatable. Um, And it's, you know, it's funny because in the sort of older cardomantic tradition, because this sort of use of tarot as a fortune telling tool derives from cardomancy, from using playing cards. Um, the, it used to be very, very non sort of uh, uh, mystical. I mean, in the sense that someone would tell your fortune and say, well, you're going to come into a large inheritance kind of a thing. Um, and that's not really the way we tend to use the cards nowadays. Uh, and in fact, in the very beginning, in like the, I think tarot starts in late 15th, late 15th century, late 1400s in Italy. And it was just a game, just a playing card game where the, the, the trump cards, the major arcana cards were used as kind of power cards. So you would play a hand and they would be the stronger cards. And depending on which card it was, it would take, um, take the other cards. Uh, it would sort of lead the hand. So there's a remnant of that nowadays in the sense that the journey from the fool to the world is a journey of evolution, is a journey of progression. Um, but we don't really think of one card as being you know, more important than the other in a sort of hierarchical fashion in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 is not necessarily better than nine, it's just different. So, um, So when we look at the tarot, we, almost any reader will tell you that we start from shuffling, you know, we randomize the deck as best we can, and we ask a question. So when you ask a question, you are putting yourself into a certain frame of mind, a certain space. I call it, well, I don't think it's original to me, the oracular moment where you are mm, proceeding from the assumption that there is, I call it entering like the backstage of reality, (laughs) you know? So as if you're, there's a theater and you step backstage and you see you have some access to the way things really work. And in that backstage, you can ask questions and you will receive a card, which you can then interpret to figure out, to gain that information about your situation. And the art of being a tarot reader is the art of interpretation, because Mm -hmm. every card is going to mean a great many things. Every card has a multiplicity of meanings. The deck is simply a representation of the entire world. So if you imagine dividing the world into 78 little pieces, yeah. one seventy-eighth of the world is still a lot. So, so what every tarot reader has to do is figure out a method for intuiting the correct meaning out of many meanings in each card mm-hmm. and, um, and finding a way to work with that with the client that is positive and helps them get to where they need to go. So when a person comes to you, then you've you've talked about the major arcana and the minor arcana and none has, is of greater significance than the other, but some are tied to major events and others to more everyday events. Yes. So, um, right. So let me kind of backtrack a little bit. So if you, for example, Yes. If you were to get, for example, all major arcana in your reading, say we did three card reading, 
and you got all major arcana, then that would definitely signify to me something. It would signify to me that you were going through something huge in your life, something mm-hmm. that you had very little control over, where the, where the free will dial is turned down <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah. And that there are, uh, it's, it's a time to try and engage with that with the respect that it deserves. Uh, If for example, another example is if all the cards come upside down to you, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in one of those uh, significant areas of your life, but that everything is up in the air. So many different things could happen. So whether that's, um, it's as if, if you look at it from the fate, destiny, Uh, framework it's as though fate is sort of like saying I'm throwing a hurricane your way and many many different things may come out of it (laughs) so and this is not you know every reader does that differently some people read you know some people read reversals in a different way this is just from my experience over 25 years working with the cards that's how they speak to me Um, tarot is very much a personal language that you develop over time Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll come back to this in, in a kind of abbreviated fashion with just a series of questions to understand it better. But how did you get into tarot? <laughs> so I was um, not the kind of person who would do tarot. Um, what kind of person it? does tarot? <laughs> <laughs> at least at the time. So at at the time when I first encountered tarot, it was 1987. Mm-hmm. And I was in college. And I had been a very good student up to that point. <laughs> I was a musician and a very good student. And I was headed for like a career in who knows what, but something very serious minded. <laughs> that was what I thought. And my college roommate well actually not my roommate but the person just one door down from me had a tarot deck and this was at harvard mind you this is not a place that where people do tarot generally and um, i understand what you (laughs) meant yes and um and, and i was fascinated by that i was like we are in this place that is a temple to reason and you are using tarot cards please tell me more about that so uh so i was fascinated by this and I I didn't understand how she could do it, first of all, the mechanics of it, because 78 is a big number of cards Mm -hmm. to, I thought, memorize. And I would just kind of keep going back to her and kind of trying to get readings and learning about it. And (laughs) after that, I kind of forgot about it for a long time. After I graduated, I went and I worked in book publishing for a long time. And and around, uh, I guess about Four years later, I decided that, you know, I'm living in New York now. I'm a grown up. I should do all the things I've always been hesitant to do. And one of them was this. So I picked up tarot and I just started working with it and kind of taught myself. Uh, Mm -hmm. There were some definitely book resources that helped. And there was a group of tarot readers that called the Tarot School in New York, which I would occasionally drop into. Uh, But really, and I would tell this to anyone who's trying to learn tarot, it was um, a hands-on experience of just trying to do it, trying to talk to people, reading for friends. Um, Within a few years, I was kind of moonlighting at night at a cafe and just, you know, doing readings for tips just to get the hang of it. And, um, And then... After a few years of that, I really just dropped out again and just did it for friends and family. I concentrated on my career. I moved to Massachusetts with my husband and had a family. I was a food writer and just kind of kept it on the down low for (laughs) for a while uh, until 2015 when I realized that there was a larger community of tarot readers online Mm -hmm. that I could join. And I felt empowered by that, by meeting other people who I could talk to and who I could, you know, I felt um, were serious minded people that I could actually take this into my life and explore its mysteries more uh, in depth. And 
So that's when I started becoming involved in the esoterics of the tarot, what we call the, the sort of meaning behind the symbols, the, mm. um, the, the, I guess, esoteric history behind them, the astrology, the uh, elemental symbolism, the Kabbalah, the, the wow. history. And that's what I specialize in now. Um, but really, I find that it's, it's, it's a specialty, but it's not. Uh, I use tarot in a way, I think, that is broad-based intended to just improve people's lives. I, you know, if I'm doing a reading for someone, if I'm doing a reading for you, we won't be talking about the Kabbalah. <laughs> we'll be talking about, I'll be doing that in my head, but we'll be talking about what you can do in your life, you know, to get to a better place. <laughs> yeah. I was watching, um, partly in preparation for this, I was watching, I was looking for a movie the other night with, with Taro in it, and I ended up watching The Red Violin. I don't know if you've oh, seen yes. it. Oh, yes, 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 I do remember that. Mm -hmm. that. That movie's a bit intense. but <laughs> It is. <laughs> in my search, I found this really short clip. I think it was Callista Flockhart doing a reading for the Glenn Close. I don't remember, <laughs> but it was called The Great Pretender, that scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you've seen it, but it was, it was one of those very classic scenes of what we assume that Tara is about, right? I think she'd laid out these 10 cards and she was yes. telling her all this stuff, which is all negative about, you know, her. <laughs> yes, of course. And um, yeah. I was just like, okay, that's, that's kind of a lot to tell people. So that's my long-winded way of asking, when you do readings and you encounter what looks like bad news, how do you how do you handle that? Yes, so so whenever um, that happens, I try to remind people that uh, in life and in tarot, because tarot is simply life, it's just a way mm -hmm. of looking at it. When something comes up, there's always a better and a worse response. You know, nobody asked for this virus to come and hit all of us. Nobody, nobody asked to be locked down, but there's always a better and a worse response. So what I use tarot for is not just to figure out what is likely to happen, but what you can do about it. Uh, there's always, you know, fate proposes... And you can accept, but you can also propose, you can counter propose. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I actually have a practice every morning where I draw two cards. I see what's going to come on, come along in the day, or I get a sense of what's coming into the day. And I have a conversation with the cards about how I'd like to work with that energy. So, you know, and the other thing is that there is no specifically, you know, very bad or very good card. Um, there is something... There are definitely cards which are more difficult than others. Uh, for like example, this, this card, tower. the tower, yes. <laughs> Famously bad card. Um, and yet there is also a positive, um, there is a positive story to be told about the tower as well. For example, one story that I like to, just a quick tangent to associate with the tower is the story of the Tower of Babel, which you will be familiar with, yeah. where, you know, where where humankind had the hubris to try and build this edifice towards the divine. Um, it's a symbol of ambition and forgetting where you come from. And mm -hmm. as a punishment, God split the tongues of humankind so they could no longer speak with each other. And the tongues, the languages of the world were confused. Now, one way is to see that as an act of um, you know, transgression and an act of rebuke. But another way to look at that is to say that the splitting of the tongues, which is one way to look at this, was an act of mercy, an act of grace, because it forced people to turn away from what they were doing and turn towards each other to try and work together again to survive, to work the land instead. One version of the story says that everyone was starving because they were, you know, concentrating on this monument which was really a monument to their own ego rather than looking at one another and working with one another. So, you know, one way to look at the tower is to say that this great cataclysmic event happens in life and it forces you to go back to basics and to re-examine your life and re-examine your priorities, which is not always a bad thing. But in the moment, though, yes, <laughs> I think be one of the people in the tower that was getting thrown off. Like it's, 
<laughs> yes. And the other thing that I will always do, if it looks like, you know, something very stressful is coming down the pike, <laughs> is I often draw cards to guide people as to what, what they should and shouldn't do. So mm, should is not usually the word I use. I will say, okay, so here is a constructive thing that will help you experience mm -hmm. this in a more productive way. And here is something that will definitely not. So we will sort of split the deck into two halves, draw a card yeah. from each and try and figure out coping mechanisms and things to avoid. <laughs> All right. So show, show us some more cards that are either very good or very, I'll use the layman's terms. Yes. I, I have come across the 10 of swords and that card is just so, it's it so is terrifying. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the thing is that this is why I tell people, I'll pull my Ten of Swords out here. So this is why I tell people to work with every card every day. So um, by, so what I do, as I've mentioned, I, I draw two cards every day. You can draw one or whatever. And over the course of a year, you will draw them all. <laughs> there is no question about it. You will draw them all usually by, uh, usually by say seven months in. So like right now I have drawn, this is an exceptional year. I have two cards that are missing. I haven't gotten the King of Wands or the Hermit. I don't know why, but, um, but, but you're already, you're yeah. already at home. The Hermit doesn't need to show up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's interesting. I'm at home and everybody is here with me, my whole family. So there's no, there's no Hermit time. But um, so that's probably why. But in terms of um, drawing the, the every card, um, it forces you to confront what it might mean in a, an everyday sense. And once you've drawn every card, you learn not to be so afraid of them. So for example, I've drawn 10 of swords any number of times um, and for myself. And, you know, because I am obsessive uh, analytical person, I keep a spreadsheet of every single time I've drawn it. I journal everything. So I can look back and say, I've drawn 10 of swords 27 times in the last 15 years. This is what it wow. means for me. This is how it comes up. And this is what I do about it. So for me, this card uh, tends to represent a range of things. Um, it can represent being very tired, you know, literally needing to take a nap because you're so tired. Um, Do you end up with knives in your back? <laughs> no, no. But, but metaphorically, sometimes the reason you're very tired is because you were up late thinking about things that, you know, were really bothering you. And that is a manifestation of the Ten of Swords. Uh, not for myself, but for clients, I often see this card as clinical depression. Being so consumed by difficult um, uh, effects in your mind that you can't do anything. The kind of depression that, you know, people can't get out of bed often comes up as this card. And mm -hmm. it is really, um, you know, it gives me some understanding and some empathy for what people are going through because it helps me to understand that, you know, depression is just, is not necessarily just a figment of your imagination. It will literally pin you down, you know, mm -hmm. and keep you from getting up again. And, mm -hmm. Um, so that's a, very, a pretty negative manifestation that I see pretty often. Um, and it is like, for those people who experience it, it is like having knives in your back. You know, it is like being yeah. unable to do anything. Uh, less, uh, there is a very benign manifestation of this card that I've found, uh, which is coming to the end of a thinking process. So, for example, um, if I finish writing a book or if I finish teaching a class, something like that will sometimes come up as the Ten of Swords because swords are associated with thoughts, with words, with um, analytical processes. So, and that doesn't worry me so much when that happens. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just something that's going to happen. And sometimes, you know, you will feel exhausted at the end of it and it will come up uh, just because you, there's usually a sense of uh, having come to the end of something and being able to go no further with the Ten of Swords. Uh, nevertheless, when I see the Ten of Swords, which I do relatively, you know, uh, infrequently relative to 
other cards. I'm sort of looking at my spreadsheet right now, and um, <laughs> yeah, I've gotten it 45 times in in five years. So it's a little less than average. Um, you know, when when I see it, sometimes what I do, I teach people to do uh, apotropaic magic. So apotropaic magic is a form of magic where you shield yourself from things that you think will be uh, detrimental to your well-being. And so what I do is I tell people what you can do is you can uh, trigger the Ten of Swords. And for example, I might go to the store and buy 10 sewing needles, you know, <laughs> because I'd sew and that's one of the things I regularly need. And if I buy 10 sew sewing needles, that's a manifestation of the Ten of Swords, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I will say, as I buy the 10 sewing needles or out in the parking lot, maybe, I'll say the requirements have been fulfilled. <laughs> And so that's a way of saying, okay, we're done with this for the day. Let's, let's, let's call this card finished and say that we don't need to do any more. Uh, we don't need to, it to manifest in any more dire way. So um, that's one way that I sometimes deal with the card that looks like that. Um, other ways, other times I just don't worry about it and I will just build a, um, a meaning into my, understanding of the card that day. I write a spell for every pair of cards. I will build an understanding into that spell that it means something else, that it means, you know, that I've, uh, that I'm putting a project to rest um, or that I'm making a final decision on something, which is another meaning. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's one more card I want to come to, but I want to pause here for a second. They're going to show who listens to this and say, this is not Harry Potter. Why is she talking about spells and magic? And what is this stuff? Yes. So yes. This is wild and crazy. Mm -hmm. What do you What do you say to them? How do you How do you address? <laughs> no, I don't really worry about it in the sense that okay, so magic. Uh, yes, as soon as you re raise the word magic, which I do as often as possible, people often have a reaction to it because their yeah. impression of it is from. Harry Potter, uh, or from some other source of um, sort of popular culture. And to me, magic is simply agency. You know, when we talk about fate and free will, to me, free will is magic, um, is the ability to do what you want in this world and to act in a way that is in accord with your wishes. It is, magic is neither inherently positive or negative. It is amoral. So you have to be careful the way you use it. Um, magic is the ability to uh, go beyond circumstances or around circumstances mm -hmm. to do the thing that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, magic, my understanding of magic is that we are, we are not separate from the world around us. We are yeah. an expression of the world around us. And Magic, to me, is a way of working with that connection, with understanding that I am not separate from my surroundings, that I have an effect on my surroundings, and that if I listen with respect to my surroundings, that we have a conversation, then I can, as I would in a conversation with any person, yeah. have some ability to persuade or to, um, to argue my case, right? So, uh, so in the same way that, you know, everything you do, even in real life, when you take your umbrella with you, when it's raining outside, that is a very small magical act, right? To protect mm. you from what happens. So I define magic in a very broad sense. However... Yeah. There is, if you look at the world in a magical way, you can understand that, um, that you are not separate from the world. So what I mean by that is like, you know, I try to get away from the idea of magic as something based in, you know, the Western tradition, which is what Harry Potter is based in. Yeah. You know, the idea that there's wands and spells and certain, you know, ceremonial things you must do. Um, mm -hmm. 
I think that's an expression of magic, but not the only one, because magic has been around as long as people have been around. So pre-literate cultures have magic, you know, Uh, any kind of, as long as there are people, there are people trying to do something. (laughs) So, and that's magic. So, you know, I am trying really hard in my magical practice to get down to, um, what is magical thinking? What is magical work? Working with nature, working with outside, uh, working with what I find. You know, I literally believe you can sit down and do magic with sticks and stones, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that is because magic is the act of, at least the technique of doing magic has to do with working with symbols. So you say this means, you know, this stone means a particular thing. So by manipulating it in this way, I am trying to have a particular thing happen. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you can just as easily, you know, for example, if you sit down and you want to pretend to, you know, let's do a very conventional kind of stereotypical act of magic is to, uh, is to do a love spell, right? So you could sit down, I could sit down at my desk. I'm just looking at what I have here. I have like a, um, a pencil and I have a pen, (laughs) right? And I can say, you know, a magical act might be to say, this is one person, this is the other, and I'm going to bring them together now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's assigning symbolic representation to each object and then by, and then doing the magical act, bringing them together. And then, you know, maybe tying some thread around them or something like that. That's a magical act. So, you know, I don't think that you can just, uh, you know, I think part of the magical act has to include intention, has to mm. include whatever it is that takes you into a magical mind frame. And that's why we associate magic with like magic circles and incense and, you know, and potions and things like that, because that's a way of getting into magical headspace. Mm. But, um, but Tara is like that as well. There's a, there's a, you can work with the cards in the same frame of mind and say, okay, this represents something that I want. This represents where I am. I'm going to put them together and find Mm -hmm. my way from this card to that card. Mm. So it is both a way of finding out potentially what might happen and also a tool for causing something to happen. Because I don't believe those two things are entirely separate. And in fact, most of my practice is about sort of standing in the intersection of what is going to happen and what might happen and what I would like to happen and trying to bring those things together. Okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I'm being, I'm being very mindful of your time. Yes how, yes. how much more time do you have? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. I'll see if we can do. We could talk things. all day. <laughs> okay, we could. This is interesting to me. Yeah. So <clears throat> I know the audience would be interested in a demo, but before mm-hmm. I even, to that whether it's just a one card reading or whatever i'm going to do some rapid fire questions see if we can give them single one word answers or one phrase answers Mm -hmm. so um what do cops stand for oh cups emotions and feelings swords thoughts and conflicts wands the life force pentacles Material resources. Can you predict death through the tarot? Not sure that's a one word answer, (laughs) but I have, I have. Um, It isn't the death card. I think it's different for everyone else. For me, sometimes the judgment comes, card comes up as death. Okay. Um, Your, what, do you have a favorite card? The Wheel of Fortune. That's my favorite. What is that? I don't understand that, that card at all. To me, the Wheel of Fortune represents a lot of what we've been talking about. It represents mm-hmm. the idea that um, some things are inevitable, and yet you live within that framework. Um, it's also traditionally a very fortunate card. Uh, but to me, it's a little bit, it represents the mysteries of what you can and cannot know in life. 
And exactly. that's what I love about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the most mysterious card in your experience? <laughs> that's hard. Maybe the wheel of fortune, maybe the wheel okay. of fortune. Uh, the chariot is also quite mysterious, quite, okay. quite uh, difficult to work with in some ways. Um, what, what is the last card in the deck? Is there a last card? Good question. Some people will say the world, and there's a very good argument for that. Um, I would also make an argument um, for, do I have it right here? I don't have, oh yes, for the 10 of pentacles. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Hmm. but to explain why would take well, 10 minutes. <laughs> all right. And, and, and I think I'm down to three minutes. Um, what else did I want to ask you? What is the scariest? First of all, I assume you read for yourself. Mm -hmm. What is the scariest message you have received for yourself from the tarot? If you're able to share that. That's a really great um, That's a really great question. I would say that the way I read tarot the mind frame I put myself up in when I read tarot is one where I cannot be frightened because before I shuffle the deck, I am placing myself in the frame of mind that any answer is okay. You know, and I will sometimes ask myself, what is the worst possible answer look like? And I will envision that in my mind as well as the best one to prepare myself. So I would say I'm never, um, frightened, but I'm sometimes disappointed. <laughs> and for example, my first podcast, uh, I will give, just give you a quick example. My first pro podcast, I asked, you know, what I might expect from it. And I got this card. <clears throat> and oh. yeah, which is a card, the Five of Pentacles is a card of poverty. Uh, it's a card of, you know, being left out in the cold and uh, and, and, but it also has good things about it as well. And both the good and the bad came out of that first podcast. Um, it was not financially successful, but I learned some things that I needed to learn. So it's just information. Okay. So you said you pulled out cards this morning. So I, I have not pulled a card this morning yet, actually, for my day. So Okay. I was going to ask you if you could have seen how our start went this morning. <laughs> uh, yes, I will. I'll tell you what I would have expected to see. If um, one thing, some cards I might have expected to see uh, in my personal language of tarot, uh, I might have expected to see the five of pentacles in terms of our technical difficulties, but a, a better representation might be this card, the eight of swords. Uh, which is like not being able to do the thing you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty typical way that comes up for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Susie, first of all, thank you for your patience. Thank You're you welcome. for your time. And thank you for just sharing your knowledge and your expertise with me and with the audience. I hope we can do this again sometime if you yes. <laughs> the yes. today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so too. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And likewise, um, thank you so yeah, much. Good luck. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. What events transformed your life? Hi, I'm Abby Mambo, creator of Mama Talk Talk and host of Mama Talk Talk's A Different Take podcast. Join me this fall as I speak to nine engaging and fascinating people around the world to learn what their defining moments were. But first, catch a sneak preview. Just said if anyone asks you for documents tell them you your dad has it um and i remember being 
Like, that's weird. And then he was saying, you can't tell anyone that we're here illegally. We felt it immediately. It almost is as if the moment you step into a room and you are very clearly overweight, it's like this conversation becomes open for everybody to think about what you should be doing to help yourself. And then Dave, the vice president, called and said, you, you need to come to my house right now. And went to his house and it turns out uh, someone had found what they thought to be a bomb. Baby smile at six weeks and this was the six week e email. It, you know, it wasn't like she was late, but you know, maybe maybe we had a sense that, that something was perhaps wrong because it, it struck me so hard. So the first year was good. The second year, we kind of broke even. The third year, it went down. And he turns around the tissue box. On the other side of the tissue box, he created a handmade sticker in advance with red Dahlia's tissue box. I was working in the emergency room and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I realized I was in the emergency room bed and being carted off to have an emergency surgery. Um, and so it was at the time it was it was it was difficult because you're sort of dragged into a situation that is not of your own. Uh, your motives are questioned. Your ethics are are, are questioned. Mm -hmm. The person that was walking around was not me. It was just a silhouette of me who I could not recognize, and that scared me. But where had I gone? Where had I lost myself in this in this journey that was supposed to be beautiful? Well, you no, know, being a mother and trying to be a leader um, were, were, were two difficult things at this time because I'm trying to process how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm angry. I'm upset. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I need to do something, but I don't know what to do.